All right, so welcome everyone. Um, tonight we have Dr. Todd Butler who will be uh, do, doing a presentation on medical emergency prevention, dental first aid, and minor surgery. So we appreciate Dr. Butler for that. Um, just before we start, a reminder, and it came out with the bill, Millville City Bill, uh, that CERT training starts on March 6th. The county is sponsoring that. And so there's quite a bit of information on that. And uh, besides being a really good thing to do, uh, it, one of the big incentives is it costs 50 bucks a person to do. But if you complete the course, the city will reimburse you 50 bucks. So, the more CERT members we have in the community, the longer the fall things that we're doing, the better prepared we'll be uh, as a community in case of a disaster or emergency. So, uh, Cindy Cummins, and, and this is in, again in the newsletter from the city, but the Cindy Cummins is, I think, the go to person for more information on that. And then Roberta had a question Do any of you remember those comments made? by somebody that you could order the big water barrels through their company and get free shipping. Does anybody remember hearing that? Yeah, I remember hearing it. Do you remember who it was that said that? I have Steve, Steve Regan. That's where you go to get them. I don't know who said it. About like 200 north and yeah. west. Across from the radio station on 200 north. Yeah, water storage right. supplies, blue barrels, 55 gallon. It's, it's, a, it's a business, Regan. Regan's business. Okay, <laughs> goes there to get farm stuff. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know. Well, well that's market, good information. But I got that in my notes. I think that's from. what you want to know. Yeah. So, okay. good, good notes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, then there's, we won't belabor it. We'll turn the time over to Dr. Butler and you can give us the story. All right, well, this information tonight, I mulled over for a long time because for the last 25 years, maybe even more, I've either dealt with some kind of bug, bacteria, fungus, teeth. Uh, so this has kind of been a part of my life on a daily basis. So looking at this information, um, at first I was thinking uh, the way that I think, that I see this every day and people don't want to know all the basics of that. But once I got into it and started putting these slides in, I realized I was leaving huge gaps in information that would probably even make it not even make sense. So I went back and looked at it, and once I started on that, what we'll do, what we'll get through today, and this is a two-part section, but what we'll get through today is we'll get through the prevention, uh, dental first aid, and as we go along, if there's, ask questions, stop and ask questions, if I'm not clear enough, if I'm skipping stuff that's, or, or if it's just too basic, you're going to, then just tell me, hey, we already know that, let's go on. Okay, um, so if we're looking about being prepared, um, when I look at this, uh, as I put this together, this information together, I look at it in two ways. There's two emergencies that I can have, that we can have. I can have an emergency in my home today with my family. Most common type of emergency. It's just an emergency for me. It's not an emergency for anybody else, but it is an emergency for me. So what do I need to do in that? The second type of emergency would be... Uh, the, the biggest one I can think of would be if we had an earthquake here in Cache Valley and what systems would be lost. And so I kind of base it on, on everything that I do, I base it on that fact, on that scenario, saying if we had an earthquake. Because if I look at it that way, I can go backwards and anything more simple than that, then I can take care of it because I'm going to know how to take care of that disaster. Um, and so, and like it says here, if you're prepared, you can turn a disaster into a vacation or into an adventure, like these guys here on the bottom, that their house was built in a way that they knew that they were in a floodplain. So when it floods, they get their lawn chairs out and fish, you know. And then everybody else, most everybody else knows the Griswolds, right? And he can turn any adventure into a disaster. So uh, <laughs> depending on what we know and the way that we react to the situation um, determines the outcome. Okay, uh, I'm not going to go over first aid kits tonight because of what should be in a first aid kit. I do have, I have made a first aid kit that I believe is the one that is, that is the best for a disaster situation. Um, and we'll go over that next week. It actually, part of it, most of it comes from the Mayo Clinic 
and what they say a household um, first aid kit should be, but it's I think it's a little bit incomplete if we're looking at just that little bit extra. You can spend an extra twenty dollars and get everything you'd need for that big disaster, not just a home kit. So we'll go over that next week because it kind of goes along with everything that's next week. So, but even just the band-aid. If you got the band-aids, you should have a first aid kit. Uh, you can see these little ones. They've got you know a little. Have one in your car, okay? I find that I've actually, over the last five years, replaced those um, almost on a yearly basis because I've used them, okay? Um, and hopefully you don't have to. Uh, like this last summer, I stood out in the field. My nephew bounced his face off the ground, and I stood out in the field and stitched his chin together and taped his face back together for him. So if I didn't have that in there, um, I wouldn't have been able to do that. You know, we would have been taking him 200 miles to the emergency room because we were out in the middle of Idaho in the middle of nowhere when it happened. So um, it's just worth, and I look at it as I hope I never use it, but if I have it, if I don't have it, I'll need it, right? If I do have it, I'm never going to use it. But I, So I'm going to step back because if I look at, so I'm going to go clear back to, um, bacteria. If we're talking about prevention, what are we trying to prevent? Okay? Um, and so if we look at uh, a, an emergency situation, disaster, people are going to be hurt. Okay? We're going to lose our water system here. Um, what's going to be the biggest problem that we're going to have today, in two days, in two weeks? Okay? Uh, anybody that's hurt this is something bacteria is going to be a source of their problem within a couple of days, okay? And so how do we take care of that? And also, if you think about it, if, if our road system goes down or you don't have electricity, and uh, we've already seen this on the East Coast, right? Two weeks, some of them were two weeks without water. And that was this month. So there are some big cities that were two weeks without water. And so it, when we're looking at that, if we lose electricity, you're not even going to be able to use a, a credit card at a, at a grocery store. Even if the grocery store has a generator, it's highly unlikely that the communication between the bank that has your card and your money and that, that grocery store is going to work. So the, those are things that I... I try to get you to think about, or that I think about. What's going to happen in that situation? Well, um, a bacterial infection, we need to control that bacteria. And that's the first thing that's going to be a problem um, if we have a disaster like that. And there's two different types of, of solutions that we have to get rid of, of bacteria. Okay, bacteriostatic and bactericidal. And the difference is bacteriostatic, it just makes it so the bacteria can't grow doesn't kill them, it doesn't get rid of them. So when I take soap and I put it on a, um, a sponge <clears throat> and I wipe down my counter and then I let that dry off, I've made that, that soap is bacteria static and there could still be bacteria on that table as just dormant, I didn't kill it. If I take Lysol and I spray it across that counter and get it nice and wet so that it takes uh, five to seven minutes to dry, then that's bactericidal. So I've killed the bacteria and got it off of that surface. So there's a big difference um, in whether or not it's bacteriostatic or bactericidal. And actually, most penicillins that we look at, they're bacteriostatic. Well, they don't kill the bacteria that's present. What they do is they inhibit it from growing and dividing. When they divide, they actually die instead of growing. So it's a bacteriostatic product. And there's a big difference in those. Um, is it is it pure to ask which is the best to do? What's that? Which is the best to do? Um, that's an excellent question. It, let's go. I'm going to jump down to the bottom here. We see this stuff all the time. It says it kills 99.99 percent of bacteria. Um, what does that mean? Does it, do you understand the 0.01 percent that stayed alive? Why did it not kill that? You didn't hit it with the stuff. That's what most people think. The reason why it didn't kill it is actually because it was already resistant to the microbials, you know, antimicrobial agent that's in there. So, 
and this is why we have super infections in hospitals. It's not because they came out of nowhere, it's because they were already there, and we're using stuff that kills everything else and leaves them there because they were already resistant. And if we don't have anything to fight those ones, then they'll grow. And let's go back to the sponge, okay? Sponge in your kitchen, you put soap in it, and that soap is antibacterial. It says that kills 99.9%. And I wipe that down, wipe down that counter, and I have a little bit of meat, a little bit of food on it. And then I set that on my um, kitchen uh, counter in there, and it's still wet. It has some food stuff in it. I killed 99.99% of the bacteria. Well, the bad ones are still there. That's that 0.01% that was already resistant. I've just created an environment where they can grow. They might grow slow, and maybe I wash them down and get rid of it. And it's not a big deal. But I've created an environment where they can take over. That's why hospitals are starting to get resistant strains, because they were already there, okay? Those mutations always happen in early days. So, back to what's the best to use. So, as a biochemist, before I went to dental school as a biochemist, and my biggest thought was don't use stuff that kills 99.9%. Uh, soap by itself is bacteriostatic and bactericidal to a certain point. It will coat the bacteria and make it so it can't adhere to anything, and it also makes it harder for them to um, to divide and grow, so that to proliferate. So just regular soap does that by itself. We throw these other things in, and then that kills off and it keeps a lot of the good bacteria from being able to grow back as quick, and then that's when the opportunistic ones can take over. So if you're spraying down a countertop and you want to use alcohol, um, you really need to get that diluted to under 24% alcohol so that it stays and doesn't evaporate as quick because then it can kill everything, it, uh, even up to spores. If you put it too high of a concentration, then it won't, it, it dries out too fast and it doesn't have, and it can't affect those harder to kill bacteria. And so, um, um, on the other hand, if you're talking about, uh, so, so if I want to clean off a counter and make something, I want to make that area bacteria static, sterilize it, you know, or if I want to put on a wound, the difference is if I'm putting alcohol on a wound to clean that out, I actually want it around 70% alcohol to be effective um, in that shorter time because it's living tissue. And I, you know, it does burn. I don't want it on there very long, but I do want it to clear those bacteria out of there and rinse it out. So that there's a difference in how we use it and what it will work and how it will work. Okay? Um, so. And I'll just go through really quick. So some things that make something bacteriostatic are some antibiotics we talked about. When you clean the surface, it becomes that. Soap is, in general, temperature. And your body works that too, right? When you get bacteria in your system, you get an infection, it turns up the heat. Your body does it by itself. pH. And then um, oxygen is a big thing. Because oxygen, bacteria, there's not, <coughs> not very many bacteria that live in both environments very well. They either live without oxygen or they live with oxygen. Okay? Um, and so, an interesting one, and then we'll jump move on, but bactericidal, xylitol is actually, kills bacteria. It's a sweetener that's in a lot of non-sugar-free uh, uh, gums. And it actually does kill the bacteria in your mouth. So, um, another one is triclosan. You'll find that in a lot of your hand sanitizers. And in this case, if I'm working with, you know, if I'm going, on, I'm working with people that are sick, trying to help them, open wounds, those kind of things, you know, for those that have done CERT training, um, a hand wash or a hand sanitizer that has triclosan in it is excellent because it actually sticks to and adheres to your tissues and can be effective um, on your skin for up to 12 hours in killing bacteria on your skin. So there, it's even in some toothpaste now. So. Um, and we talked about, so, talking about bacteriostatic, bactericidal now, this kind of pulls into the difference between a disinfectant and an antiseptic, okay? A disinfectant is basically what we use on a non-living tissue or a non-living um, surface to try to kill, reduce the bacteria to reduce infection and spread of disease, okay? And Antiseptic is something that we would use on a living tissue. Okay, so mouth wrench would be an antiseptic, I'm trying to kill bacteria. Um, whereas, and 
the, probably the best way on these would be to, you can go on the website, look these up, um, because there's quite a bit of information on them and what they do, okay? Uh, and I have, I mean, afterwards, if we wanted to, I, I've got three pages right here that just talk about one side of it and then another uh, couple of pages talk about the other side of what these do. Um, if I was going to say that something that would be good to have in your storage, long-term storage for um, uh, for an antiseptic would probably be the chlorhexidine gluconate. Okay? It's a mouth rinse, it's a prescription mouth rinse, but it will also, um, you can use it on an open wound, you, you can use it basically anywhere in the body. Um, another one would be, like we already talked about, if you're using an antiseptic as an alcohol, you need it 70%, so 140 proof. And, you know, isopropyl alcohol works, um, so you can use just rubbing alcohol. Uh, a lot of those containers are not um, built to be 100 years in that container, right? Whereas, uh, and I don't advocate you going out and getting a bottle of Jack Daniels, but if you have one of those that's 140 proof, they package those things to be in that bottle for 100 plus years. And so if you have that locked away in a cabinet somewhere in the back, you've got a type of alcohol that you can rinse a wound with that you can rinse out an abscess tooth with, um, and it's at the high, high enough concentration that you know it's going to be okay. And, and you've got a hundred, you've got a bottle that's going to last hundred years. You do one of the little thin isopropyl alcohol things, you won't have it. Can I, Another thing. Could I, I'm sorry. What was yes. you said? You said seventy percent. If you're rinsing, you said hundred and forty percent. So one hundred and forty proof. See, proof. yeah, okay. proof. Basically, when in the old days, if they could light like their moonshine on fire, yeah. they they knew that if it had 50% alcohol in it, they, it would light on fire, and that was 100% 100, 100 proof that 100 proof. Okay. that it was. So the, whatever the proof is, the alcohol is half of that content. So really... Oh, that's... And, okay, 70, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So 140 proof is would really be 70%. Gotcha. And, and so again, yeah, if you're rinsing countertops and that, you want it to be under 24, but if you're rinsing... Right live tissue, you, you want it to be 70%. Does hydrogen peroxide kill live tissue when you use it? Um, it can burn it if it's a high enough concentration. It will boil away dead tissue first just because of the nature of the tissue, but if it's if it's there long enough in a high enough concentration, it will burn um, normal tissue. And the Jack Daniels will kill pain. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it will numb you up good. <laughs> <laughs> it will numb you up good. Uh, you know what? And that will come in handy later because there's a couple things I show you that without anesthesia, it's going to hurt. Okay? Oh, yeah. A couple of things on here on the antiseptic. Iodophores, you know, a lot of people will say that they're allergic to iodine. Very few people are allergic to iodophores. Okay? Um, they use them in surgical scrub. Uh, when you go in and they're going to do surgery on you, they start with their fingers and they scrub with iodophores down to their, down to their elbows. Um, but iodine in that form, a lot of people, th there's a relatively high number of people that are allergic to it. But iodophores, which is also a form of iodine, people are not. It's very, very rare that they are. Can you just find that at, at any store or is that... Uh, iodophores, yeah. Um, I'd have to look I'm at this. Curious. See, well, that's an excellent question, and I hadn't thought about it. See, we talked about this before. I deal with this every day, so all I do is I tell my girl, I say, I need, and she picks and it she up. Is. So I'll research that and find out that Maybe question we, next we week to see if you can buy it over the counter. Yeah. Um, if I know you can buy the, the hand sanitizers and stuff that are in the yeah. hospital. You can buy those at pharmacies. Right. But I'll look, because I just okay. I just get them out of a magazine. But I'll, I'll okay. look that up and... and make sure that I know. So we talked about we're going to have if you have a disruption of your services here in the valley, first one that's going to go is water. Okay, we talked about some of those guys um, on the east coast that didn't have pure water. Okay, there's a couple things to think about when you're pure, when you have a water purifier. Um, like that straw up in the top left hand corner, it's excellent. It's a carbon filter straw, it'll get rid of bacteria. It might not get rid of all the taste, so you might have a funny taste from other minerals in the water. 
but it's excellent for I can lean over and drink out of even a stream if I want it. Okay. Um, its drawback is it has a finite life. It's going to do 40 gallons or 20 gallons or whatever it tells you. Um, and so if it's a relatively short time, like 72 hours, which they tell us now 144, that's going to be great. Okay. But if I'm looking at going into big, a, a high amount of water over a, a, a long time, if, we, if you're two weeks, that will be done and you won't be able to shower with it either. Right? Um, the next one up here is reverse osmosis. These are just different ways to purify your water. Reverse osmosis is that top left-hand corner. They're great. They are awesome. It's going to give you pure water. But the, the membrane in it, it has a finite life, depending on how much part of particulate matter it has to filter out. It's going to stick to it. And eventually, that will stop filtering too. Um, usually, those ones you can tell because the water almost doesn't go through it anymore. Stay I think it's important to point out too, though, with those uh, first couple of them, while they'll kill bacteria, they don't take out bad chemicals, the right. poisons, and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, we'll talk about that when we get down here to the distill, distill, because that's a very important point. There's two reasons why water can be harmful to you: bacteria in it, or whatever type of bug that's in it that can get into your system and infect you or if there's chemicals in it that shouldn't be there. Um, a carbon filter, which both of those two do have, will filter out some of those, but it also has a finite life. Okay? Um, the, the one that says uh, the cayenne, cayenne, however you say that, this is the one that I would recommend everybody has. It's a backpack pump for drinking water. It's a porcelain pump. The reason why I recommend that is because it will produce drinking water for you unless you think the water's contaminated. Okay, but if you go to a stream and you pump it, this one, if it starts to get hard and the water's not going through it, you take it out and you clean off that porcelain filter, put it back in. It doesn't have a finite life like the other ones do. And the other ones won't warn you when they run out. They just stop working and all of a sudden you're drinking bad water. Okay, this one, when it gets hard to pump, you can just clean it up. And so it's renewable. Yes. On the uh, Canadine uh, filters, the yeah. hand pump ones, uh, they have extra filters for them that you can buy separately. And yeah, you can hook a carbon filter on it. But the porcelain... No, I mean the porcelain, you can buy extra porcelain. Yeah, filters. yeah, and you know, I, I have one that's 12 years old and I take it, can, I take it yeah. backpacking it's and I still don't have... You know, as it gets, and they say the drawback is as it gets particulate matter in there, it's going to be harder to pump, so you're going to know. But I just take a, a just a little, uh, not a steel wool, but those the little green kitchen pads, and just scrub that down when it starts doing that, and and I'm good. So mine came a little blurry. You don't have to work out as long when it gets tough. That, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now the bottom one, this sweet looking contraption on the bottom, that's a distiller. Okay. That's the only way that you're going to actually get completely pure water. There's a lot of ways to do it. There's even some that are solar. Um, I've seen one that costs about 200 bucks and it's in a backpack. You blow it up, you put your water in it. The nice thing about that is most toxins or most chemicals that are going to be toxic to you, um, they have a, a higher boiling point than water does. So, you'll, so what you do is you start this, you get it so that it's evaporating, then you close it off. Because once you see the water evaporating, anything that would be lighter than that is going to be gone then you're going to have an evaporation point of the water and, and that will stay at that temperature until all the water's gone. And then those chemicals will be left in the bottom. So distilling, you're going to just take what comes off of it, discard that extra and then do, you know, do another batch. A distiller will get you pure water and it, it's going to either leave the bacteria in it, uh, in the bottom, um, any chemicals in the bottom, and you can just discard that sludge at the bottom or I wouldn't even wait until it was you know, getting down to that. I, so, that's the only way that you're going to get really pure water. Do we need it around here? Probably not. You know, but that's why I say, it, it, I would recommend the porcelain pump because it's basically renewable. You're not going to run out it, 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 of water, drinking water, if you use that. About how much are they? Huh? How much are the porcelain pumps? Uh, about $70, $70, dollars for a good one at any of the backpacking stores. Um, if you watch, I saw them on sale, um, this particular one that I was just showing you back here, 
Um, I saw that one on set at Sportsman's Warehouse uh, about two weeks ago for 49 So the between 50 and 120 you can pump? find a nice one. A porcelain pump is really what I'd recommend okay. with that. And that's years of backpacking. That's the one that has endured the test of time for me. Okay? There's another thing that a lot of people don't think about sanitation-wise, okay? Um, if you have a food storage, whatever that may be, however long you, you're thinking of that, um, we don't think about shampoo, toilet paper, and I really don't think you can, you can keep six years worth of toilet paper in your house. So, you know, but these are things to think about. Um, floss, uh, toothbrush. It's really cheap to have ten toothbrushes in your storage. And even if you don't have toothpaste, you run out of toothpaste, you can clean your teeth quite well with a toothbrush and floss. And we'll show you that later too. So these are things that you don't think about. Sanitation napkins, um, hand sanitizer, soap. If I'm, if, if, if we have a natural disaster and it's two to three, we're not going to be the first people that they come find. They're going to go to Salt Lake, they're going to go to Ogden, they're going to go to all these big, we're going to be the last one they come to. How much soap do you have? Um, how much deodorant do you have? Those, those are my, might be things to think about putting some of that in there. Especially soap, because we talked about that's a sanitation thing. That's something that's going to keep me from getting sick. And that can do a dual purpose of very good band-aids. Yes. Yeah. Um, is there any specific soap that you is recommended? Uh, I prefer, you know, I do like, if you're getting hand sanitizer, if you find some with triclosan in it, um, I would do that. So, I actually am one of the people that uh, advocates buying cheap soap and not, not buying the stuff that has the antimicrobial stuff in it. Um, because, when we talked about that Give me some examples. Of brass. It, it will just sit, well, I don't know brass, ivory? but, but okay. it will say, yeah, I'd buy ivory, I'd buy, yeah, that ivory's great, Dove, that doesn't okay. have maybe a little bit of moisturizer, but the ones that say antimicrobial in it, kills 99.99%. You don't want those. Um, I, I wouldn't say use it on a regular basis. Okay. Um, before I went to dental school now, I was a biochemist for years, did research, and, and basically a lot of people have the perception that we had talked about earlier that when it kills 99.9, .9, it's because we missed those. Really, the not, that 0.001% that isn't killed is because they were already resistant to whatever we're killing the rest with. And so now that's a, what we would call a bad bug. And if it takes over because nothing else is there, then we've created a super infection. That's why hospitals have that problem. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah. So those are things to, to think about when you're, you know, on that storage shelf. It's not, it's not expensive to buy a case of ivory soap. It'll sit there forever. Um, next thing that a lot of people don't think about. If you're on a medication, uh, pharmacy has about three days worth of medication in the pharmacy. And if we had a big winter storm and they couldn't get in the valley for a couple of days, couldn't get a truck in here, after four days, if you don't have that medication, you're not picking it up. So these are things to think about. Whatever medication you have, if you talk to your doctor, sometimes they will let you get a couple of months ahead as you go. You know, so pick up two prescriptions instead of one and just stock, stock that up so you're moving out the old and using the new. And so penicillin, um, so that's a good thing to think about. A lot of people don't think about that because we can always just call up the pharmacy and they'll have it ready before we get there. Um, but if there's no pharmacy, can we get it? And if you need insulin, uh, you know, if you, what, thyroid, if you have a thyroid um, issue and you need those, how, how long is that going to last, you know? If you got insulin, you're a diabetic, um, these little trailer fridges, freezers and propane, you can keep your insulin cold if there's no power. Okay. Yeah, and, and see, that's good information to have. Some things that I would say that you want to have on hand, you want to have a uh, topical painkiller, so, and any of them have benzocaine in it, that's what they do. Ibuprofen, Tylenol, um, you'll find that there's quite a bit of use of those. Um, Antifungal, I put Lotrimin and Monistat up there. If you get an oral infection, and, and 
I think Stan was, I was talking with Stan earlier. Every time you eat an apple, you're putting fungus in your mouth, whether you like it or not. You are. It's on that, that nice shiny wax layer. There's, there's fungus spores in that. And oranges um, are worse. <laughs> yeah, and if you, so if you got an oral infection, you can take one of those monostat suppositories and put it in your mouth, it tastes terrible. It'll probably make you almost want to throw up, and it will get rid of an oral, uh, an oral infection. Monostat. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I, Sorry. I, think Stan, I think Stan said you were going to be grossed out. But, but in, in my work, when I see somebody that hasn't taken a denture out of their mouth for three weeks, and they come in and I peel that out, and they've got a, a white film all over their mouth with red borders on it and that, if they, if they did fungus, that, that's a fungus. That and bad. the best indicator of that is if you have little red corners right here, cracking lips, irritated, and it's not going away, most likely you have an uh, oral that's fungal infection. Wow. That's thrush. Yeah, oral thrush. Mm -hmm. And the monocytal kill it, you know, one yeah. dose? Mm -hmm. Just one time? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, you just, I know it tastes terrible, but... You, know, you, you can put that in your mouth. So this is something that, you know... You've tried it before. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, most of the stuff that comes through my office, I have tasted because I put it okay. in people's mouth. So, okay. Antidiuretic ammonium AD will save somebody's life. Okay? If you get diarrhea and you have a bug in your system, that's going to um, save you from being dehydrated. 120,000 people a year die from dehydration. So is it monostat over the counter? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you wouldn't be going in that aisle very much, but yeah. <laughs> so, Stan. What about zinc? Zinc is it, it's a great, yeah, zinc's a great one because if you start feeling a little bit of a sore throat, you can suck on one of those. Zinc inhibits the, um, viruses to attach to the tissues, and thus they can't attach, they can't replicate, so that's why zinc works so well at blocking or slowing down sore throat and that because it actually inhibits the attachment of the virus to tissues. Okay, and then the last one I have on here is penicillin. Um, penicillin is everywhere, okay? The lovely penicillin that saves lives and became um, uh, one of the biggest lifesavers in World War II that there was, penicillin. Okay, all the penicillin that you buy in a tablet here in America, it, was, it came off of one culture, and it was off of... That lovely, beautiful thing up at the top, I got think, left-hand corner, yeah, that top left-hand corner up there is uh, cantaloupe. And the, the fungus, penicillium fungus that they developed, all penicillin off of, came off of a cantaloupe in 1941, okay? And all the cultures that are licensed in America to be made come off of that. But you can find it anywhere. You know, in the bottom of your orange, your box of oranges you bought for Christmas? If you still have that in your basement? Okay. You probably got four pounds of penicillin in your basement if it's still there. Grows on orange is great. Um, this cheese here in the bottom is, I don't even know how to say that. Rogaford? Rogaford? Okay. The, the dark color in it is penicillin. Penicillium, one of the best places to get it. So, one of the biggest questions I have is can you ingest the penicillin fungus? We do all the time. It floats in the air. Uh, matter of fact, if you set an orange out on your counter and let it sit there, if there wasn't any on it, just from floating in the air, it will get on it in a certain one. Um, some of these things like cantaloupe, uh, the cheese, brie cheese is another one that has it on the outside, that white layer on the outside. Okay. Basically, the penicillium fungus is the only type that can grow on those surfaces. So you're safe in, if you're looking for, you can't get it at the pharmacy, um, you'll find your orange. Now Stan gave me a rough time, he's saying that it's green, not blue fungus. Scrape some of that blue fungus off of there. Okay, this is how to make your own, this is how to make your own penicillin that can save your life just like in World War II. You can take any one of these things that you have and basically that the white that you see in the bottom corner here, white and green, that's penicillium, okay? It's not refined into the penicillin um, particulate, but as the penicillium, um, it's all in there, and it'll, it'll take care of you. So, if you want to make some of this, 
you got one of your little oranges that has some of that white, green, yellow, bluish fungus on it, scrape that off and stick it in a loaf of, it works best with, they say it grows fastest with sourdough um, whole wheat. And throw it in, throw it in there, or else another thing you can do is take a little bit of that off of there, put it on your, that beautiful New York cut steak that you just got that's nice and clean, put some of that on there, put it in, um, put it in one of those Ziploc containers, poke a hole in it, put it in the back of your fridge and forget about it for three months. Until that meat's gone. That mold, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it'll, it'll go, once it does, it'll go dormant. And then you'll have spores that you can use at any time to make a loaf of bread when you need penicillin. And it, it's good to have some of that around um, because when somebody needs it, that little bit that you have inoculate, you're gonna, it's going to take a few days to get ready and it might be too late for it. So that's why I say, you throw that in there and you turn it into this nasty looking thing in the back of your, wherever it's nice and cool. Um, you pull that loaf of bread, you pull that piece of bread out, somebody has a big old wound right here with infection in it, take one of those, dampen it up so it's a little bit soft, put it on there, put a band-aid on it. And you just, yeah. Sorry, that's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's going to kill those bacteria, and it kills a wide variety of bacteria, okay? And let's say you think your kid has strep throat. You look in there and that's red and raw and they're crying and all penicillin pharmacies going. You take a fourth of that bread, cut that piece of bread into fours, put it in warm water, hot water but not hot enough to burn your finger when you put it in. Stir that up into a nice delicious tea and have them drink it down. I know it, it's bitter, tastes bad, but it will save your life, okay? So uh, penicillin, like I said, before they really got penicillin refined and started using it in World War II. It was the number one killer in wars, was infection. Is it going to smell really bad until it's okay? No. <clears throat> no, I, and when you have it inside of that bag or anything, the only reason why you poke a little hole is because it, it's going to use up all that oxygen, and these ones need oxygen. But So don't leave yet. Yeah, it might smell bad if you leave it on this big old plate of stuff, but if you just have a little teeny hole in that, and a, and a bread bag's going to have enough breathing in it that you don't even need to leave a hole in it. We've already got a great supply then. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I was reading people that they actually, because if you want to process Don't throw that it, away, do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I actually read one thing that you can process it from penicillium, the back, or the fungus, into penicillin, and then turn it into the white powder. You sit and you scrape that off, you know, when you see it. Put it in a jar with a little bit of yeast. Uh, in, a, in a, just a water mixture, and then when it's looking pretty cloudy, you just put a little bit of citric acid in it, and that tells the back or the fungus that it's done growing, and it'll put it dormant, and then you just let it dry out, and you have penicillin. Yes. Is the natural yeast better for that than the store bought yeast? Like the natural yes. yeast? Like slower, yeah, slower yes, slower growing yeast is best. Yes. So, um, and you can go online and look. People have. They look, people that do this on purpose, you know, paying attention to it, have it for themselves. They'll have a jar sitting right on the counter, and they put this stuff in it, and they just let it go until it's getting nice and cloudy, dried out. So, or you could just eat rope for cheese. You could, yeah. If you're rich, you could do that. That's not cheap. Uh, along with your caviar. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Mother, what they call the mother on top of your sourdough starter. Is that what that is? Yeah. So that, that's what, yeah. You'll find it in a lot of places. That's an excellent place to find it. You'll notice, too, on that loaf of bread. Oh, wrong way. That loaf of bread, it has a variety of colors from white, and when it's on an orange, or white to yellow to green to blue, turquoise, according to Stan. Okay. Well, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, Let's say, and this one, dinner Saturday night, I decided to get some shrimp, some shrimp scampi. And about halfway through that meal, I found the rivet that held the handle on, on that uh, um, pan that they fried up my shrimp in. Now, I didn't find it by biting it, but the other one happened to my friend up here. Beautiful day, we were sitting on top of the mountain. Um, I think we were up at Mount Naomi, just right up here, sitting up there. We pulled out our sandwiches to eat it. And he bit into that sandwich at first bite. Bam! 
and then he breathed in, and then he screamed again because he broke that to broke a tooth. Okay, and he exposed that nerve to that nice cold air, and it's incapacitated. When that happens to you, it's it stops you from whatever you're doing. You're not going to think about your job. You're not going to think about anything. That's how bad these can be sometimes. And the best time to do it is when you're on top of the hill in that nice cold weather. Okay. How often does this happen? A lot of people think it's rare. Um, it's not. I'm in the field that I see this weekly, if not... I, you know, sometimes I might go six weeks without me to come in on a weekend, and then I'll see six people the next week to make up for it. So, um, so a little bit of dental... Um, you know, at that point you're going to say, where's the dentist? And it became an emergency for him on top of that hill. And... You, so you could have it at home. You'd be, you know, in the wilderness, probably the worst. But No, I take that back. Vacation. I did have a patient call me once from Hawaii and wanted pain meds. And Hawaii, even though I have a federal FDA license, um, or a federal DEA license, they would not per let me prescribe Lortab to him in, in Hawaii. They said I have to be standing on Hawaiian ground in order to, that's a state law. So, that's a terrible place, as much as he spent on vacation, to be miserable for it. Um, and so there's a couple of things. You know, the dentist is going to be gone. You think about it, we have an earthquake, he's staying home and he's taking care of his family. Um, if you have we fire know where you live. What's yeah. that? We know where you live. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I might hide in my office. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so, and also, so severe weather, all this stuff. Dentistry is going to be one of the first things that is discontinued. It, it, it's and most people aren't going to think about it, except for the emergency. And this and so this is where it becomes important. Um, Can clove oil deaden a little bit? Yeah, and we're going to talk about that here in just a second. Okay. So one thing I thought about with this, really, the only time that you ever hear about dentistry is when you go in and have your teeth cleaned and your dentist talks at you for 10 minutes. And you've already been tortured by the hygienist, so you're not listening. And the other time is when you're in second grade, and we go teach all the second graders how to brush your teeth. Other than that, when, when have you ever had a first aid class that talked about dentistry? Doctors don't even want to deal with it. They just send it to me. Okay? And matter of fact, hospitals rarely have dental services available. So if you're in an emergency situation, disaster situation, it's basically going to be gone. So what, and you could be days on your own. So what can you do without it? So this is what I would say you put in any first aid travel kit. Um, it's relatively cheap. And um, if you need it one time, you will love it. it it'll, and if you're on vacation and you go get a root canal done, he's going to charge you $500 for the first half of it. And that's if it's cheap. That's an expensive set on, on vacation. Most of the time, if you have this that costs you about eight, ten bucks, um, we'll save you that. So, clove oil, so that was a question I had earlier. Clove oil is a natural remedy that will actually numb the nerves. You do have to be careful with it because when it's as pure as this is, um, you sometimes want to dilute it if you're putting it on your soft tissues. If you put it on a tooth, do it full strength. But soft tissues, you need to dilute it because it will burn those tissues if it's too. If it's too strong, it can numb your tissues, uh, your gums. It can numb those just like benzocaine can. So if you don't have benzocaine, you can dilute that to about 50% water, 50% of that. Put it on those tissues, and it'll numb them. Okay? But we'll show you that. little teeny cotton pellets, small one that you can jam into where your filling broke. Uh, some dental floss, because um, when you get a piece of meat stuck between your teeth, you guys all know that, right? That nice piece of beef jerky. Leave it there for two hours and see how it hurts. See how it feels after three days. Okay, you're going to have an infection in your gums that quick. A pair of tweezers because it's hard to get back in your mouth. You're going to want something small enough that you can actually do the work where you need to do it. Um, and then some orthodontic wax. And then the other stuff is just some temporary filling material. These six things <clears throat> can save you a whole lot of pain and a whole lot of money. You need to tell you get back to your dentist. So... Um, but the best thing, first of all, oh, sorry, question. Where do you get the filling, temporary filling? All of it, you can, all of it you can get at um, Walmart. 
Yeah, you can find it all in the dental section there. You'll see it, they call it cavet or temporal, or, but it'll just say temporary filling material. And you can use it for a variety of things. It's kind of a paste when you get it, when you put it in your mouth, over a couple hours it actually hardens up. So it'll kind of stay in place. Um, you can use it to re in the crown back, and we'll see later, um, if it pops off. Um, but uh, the best thing to do is prevent it in the first place. Okay? At dentistry, it's, your teeth are something that only weird people want to mess with. The doctors blow it away. So, um, prevention, and this is something that uh, um, I thought about, because that's why I said we only teach second graders, and then you really don't hear that much about it. But uh, um, just your regular checkups can save you um, thousands of dollars. Okay? If I have to do a small filling on somebody, I'm $150. If they wait until it's starting to hurt and waking them up at night, or they're watching TV and it's starting to bug them, that's $1,800 to fix. Yeah, it's, that's, it's out of zero at the end. The reason why is because if it's giving you spontaneous pain, the bacteria is in the nerve and causing that inflammation. And it's very seldom that we can save that nerve. And so then it ends up, instead of being a filling, it's a root canal and a build up a crown to make that too strong enough to last any, any time frame. So, Floss. If I if I tell you anything, flossing will save you a thousand bucks a year at least. It's worth that much. Um, also, it's going to give you about ten years on your life, and I'll show you how. Um, let's see if there's anything else I want to say. Uh, okay. Yeah, three things you need for a cavity to get a cavity in a tooth. And I my favorite one is I have terrible teeth that my parents gave me. It's probably true. Yeah, you know, for some of those people. But you need a tooth, you need um, bacteria, and you need sugar, food stuff for that bacteria in order for it to turn it into a cavity. If you don't have one of those three things, I don't care how bad your teeth are, it can't turn into a cavity. Matter of fact, if you have all those things in your mouth, and then you eat a piece of cheese before you go to bed, n nobody will probably talk to you in the morning, but you can't get a cavity because it knocks down the pH balance in your mouth to uh, a low enough number, about 11, and you need a pH balance of 5.5, .5, sorry, I got it backwards, 5.5 .5 or lower, so 5.5 .5 to 1 in order to get a cavity. If it's 5.5 or higher, up to 11 in that, then it doesn't matter if there's sugar or bacteria in your mouth because the pH balance will not let the bacteria turn into acid. It can't. And, and that's how it works. Any cheese? <clears throat> What's that? Any cheese? Any cheese. Most cheeses hit you, run you about will get your mouth pH to about 11, just a cube, an, an inch cube of cheese. You're not going to have, you, know, you probably won't have a girlfriend or somebody to talk to you, but you won't have cavities. Um, another thing, flossing does, I want to talk a little bit about uh, preventing, preventing periodontal disease. And this is, a huge, this is a huge issue systemically that we don't think about, but we found huge links to it. Uh, it's indisputable now. Um, but what happens if you're not flossing, you'll get bacteria in between those bacteria. And some people are more predisposed, predisposed than others. But that bacteria, if it gets in between there, it, it takes 24 hours for it to get organized into a system that can actually do damage to your teeth or your gums. Okay? That's why flossing once a day stops it. You're never going to get rid of all the bacteria, but you disrupt them, they have to start over again. That's why the, thus the flossing once a day. Once it gets a foothold and it can start to grow, that plaque will calcify from the calcium in your saliva and it hardens. And now it's stuck to your teeth and your toothbrush isn't going to get it off, your floss isn't going to get it off. In some people, not all, it will start to grow into the gum line. And when it gets down below the gum line, it becomes anaerobic and doesn't need oxygen. And it starts to secrete toxins. Those toxins now can penetrate the tissues. And when those toxins hit the bone level, um, it stimulates the bone to dissolve itself away. At that point, we call it gum disease. Sometimes it's associated with pain, sometimes it's not. Um, uh, and so, but preventing that with simple floss and brushing is the best way to do that. Now, I'm going to talk about those toxins here. Right at the end, I'll talk about those toxins here. Okay? Periodontal disease. This little thing, it just it tells you 
it's kind of a nice way to tell you that it's that periodontal disease is bad. But I'm going to tell you, talk about stroke. People that have uncontrolled periodontal disease, 30% increase in stroke. It's indisputable on these numbers. We see that. And that's going to come back to, basically the reason why is those toxins that are caused by the periodontal, the, the bacteria that cause the periodontal disease, they get in your bloodstream. They irritate your circular system and they irritate uh, those, your arteries and veins and it causes slight inflammation in and then that's when the plaques can be laid down in your arterial system. So not only do we see 30% increase in um, stroke, we see 30% increase in heart attack. We see a 10% decrease in life expectancy. Um, we see 37% increase in medications that you need. So preventing this periodontal disease is going to have a systemic effect on you. And, and I'll, I'm going to show you a study at the end that goes right along with that that's talking about heart. So we talked about putting a toothbrush in your, um, in your supply kit. If you don't have toothpaste, you can use baking soda. Um, you can use, you can chew up at the end of a branch, okay? A little green stick, chew that up until it's nice and fibery, and then move that in between your teeth, and you're going to do a good job of cleaning it, okay? You won't get in between where floss can, but that's why I say, get 100 yards of floss, it's 10 bucks or something like that, maybe even less than that. Um, okay? Let me look at that. Yeah, we talked about on that bottom one. Quickest way to get a soft tissue abscess or an infection in your mouth is get a piece of meat jam between your teeth and leave it there for three or four days. You will have an, an infection in there and it can invade the tissues. Um, toothaches caused by, is that too far away from you guys? You see that picture okay? Because on that bottom left, tooth decay is going to move down through the enamel. And really if it's only in the enamel, let me see this next page here. If it's only in the enamel like that top left, it's not a cavity. I would say the enamel is cavitated. I think this is misnamed, okay? Because it's not bad. You see staining in the teeth, but it is not to a point where the bacteria can actually get a foothold. If you start brushing at that point, do some fluoride, it will harden that surface and it will be stained, but it won't go any further. Once it moves over to the next one and it penetrates the enamel into the dentin, there's enough organic material in dentin that the bacteria can reside and live in, that back, in there. And at that point, it's not going to be bothering you. Most likely, you're going to have cavity into the, the dentin, and it's not going to bother you at first. When it progresses and it's getting deeper, then its sugar will start to bother that, that tooth. So if we're talking about progression of infection into the tooth, okay? Then this bottom one, when we look here, that's into where it's irritating that nerve. And that nerve tissue is just like tissue on my arm. I cut it, my arm swells up, gets red around it, and it, that's how it heals itself, by getting more fluids to it. But when it gets to this point, it's trying to do the same thing, it's trying to swell up. It's in a solid object. So now that's when you get that pulsating effect that you hear, that throbbing of a tooth. Okay, that nerve is infected. It'll start sometimes getting a little bit of throbbing from the toxins beforehand, but so close that most of the time, um, unless you had a microscope, you wouldn't be able to discern the difference. So at this point, when it starts throbbing, you're only days away from that infection going down, out the root and into the bone. And now I have infection, a bacterial infection in the bone. And my tooth is a straw or a beehive that's seeding that into my bone, into my bloodstream, and it's going everywhere. Okay? So, uh, but by that time, if it's throbbing, it tells you that it doesn't like you when you're watching TV, most likely you need a root canal. And if you don't, okay, let's see. So we talked about that. So uh, let's go to just self-treating that tooth that hurt, that he broke, okay? That my friend broke up on the hill, okay? This top picture shows just a little hole where that silver filling broke out, and it's in between those teeth, and there's jamming food in there. Not bugging him too much, but it's irritating him a little bit. So what you can do is you take your little kit that you got, you take a toothpick or something and clean everything out of there that you can. Because if you just pack food in the bottom of it and put this stuff on top, you still have food in the bottom of the bacteria is full. That, that food is full of that. 
And then here's another one that's just a bro you know, broken on the surface because you didn't pay attention. So once you've cleaned that out with a toothpick, then go ahead and you take that little teeny cotton pellet, dip that in that clove, get it nice and saturated, and put it in that spot. And this might hurt when it does. It might sting, but that's going to numb that nerve. And then, once you do that, take that. That's where you want your, your little tweezers, toothpick, something. You're not going to get it in there with your fingers. I've done this for quite a few years. And putting one of those in, in a root canal tooth, I can't do it with my fingers. So that's why I say have a pair, a pair of tweezers in there. One of the best things you can do is a couple of toothpicks. Then that cavet, that temporary cement that I talked about, you're going to put that on top. You're going to smash it into that. And you can use your finger, smash that down in. Then bite down on it. And that's going to get your bite just right. And then wipe the excess off. Have somebody do it for you if you can. Wipe that excess off. If you leave that temporary too high, the tooth will hurt anyways because it's just like me punching in your arm. Every time you're chewing down, it's going to make that tooth sore over time. So you want to make sure that it would be better that that's a little bit low than too high. If you're feeling it, it's going to hurt worse in about an hour or two hours. And tomorrow, it'll throw again. So do you leave that cotton pellet yep. in there? With yeah, the leave it in. Okay. Yeah, put the temporary right on top of it and put it right in there. Because that's going to hold that um, eugenol, that clove extract in it. It's going to hold it in there and it's going to be effective for um, hours, if not a couple of days. Okay? It, it can be effective for a long time. And it takes a long time for that to, um, to break down and to be used up. Because just So, yeah, that's a good question. Okay. And then you're going to want to have ibuprofen. Okay? Tylenol. Uh, if you're allergic to ibuprofen, then use Tylenol. But ibuprofen has been tested over and over again. It's the number one pain med for dental pain, for reducing it. And they'll tell you 800 milligrams every eight hours. Well, um, ibuprofen is a six-hour drug. It's going to be out of your system in six hours. So if I took 800 milligrams, I have to wait eight hours. i got two hours that it's not going to be working. 600 every six hours um, is found to be the most effective. Okay? Um, unless you're a great big guy... Um, then you could take 800 every six hours, and that's a maximum dose for your liver. And that's going to come through your doctor prescribing it. So 600 every six hours, you can go four every four. Basically, however many milligrams you take, you can do that again in that many hours. Two. Take, I'm hmm? sorry. What did you say the maximum dose was? 4,800 milligrams a day. That's, a, that's as much as your liver. Unless you're a big guy, that's the, as much as your liver can break down and get out of your system. Mm -hmm. If it goes above that number, it becomes toxic to your liver, starts to poke holes in your liver, and over extended periods of time of use, it scars your liver, just like mm -hmm. too much alcohol does. Yeah. Another thing you can do if that's not quite handling the pain, you can take Tylenol and offset it by two hours. Yeah. Okay? So you can go ibuprofen, Tylenol, ibuprofen, Tylenol, if you need to. Okay? They go through the liver through different mechanisms. They don't build up. They don't interact with each other. They don't cause any toxic effect by using them together. Which one's hardest on your liver? Uh, Tylenol is. Yeah. So why do they give you 800 milligrams if it only stay in your system for six hours? That's a good question. I, 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 because I guess they think that most people, it really knocks it out. And maybe for some things other than dental pain, the 800 milligrams is a little bit better than six. But study after study shows that 600... If 600 is not going to knock out the dental pain, 800 is not going to either. So, so let's see. So, okay, talking about, I, I'm going to jump. But I got just a couple minutes. This is this is probably one of the most important things that's going to save somebody's life. Okay. These three pictures show an abscess. Little yellow bubble on the gums. The one on that top left is huge. It's on both sides of that tooth. That's huge. If that person doesn't get that, yeah, it took you a second to see it, right? If you don't drain this, there's a good chance that that will go septic and he, if he doesn't get IV antibiotics, he will be dead. Okay? So, this is, this is where you might want that Jack Daniels was talking about. Because sometimes these hurt when you poke, but you need to lance it. You either need, and if you're out in the wilderness, you don't have a needle, maybe you've got a fish hook. Take the barb off. Um, Heat that up with a match and put it through that. You need this to drain. Okay? Um, if How long you, does it take for something like that to come up? To no, overnight. Just overnight. You're overnight. overnight. You'll have a tooth that's bugging you and you wake up in the morning. And sometimes it's that big when you wake up in the morning. 
depending on your system. That's another reason why periodontal disease is so important because if you have active periodontal disease, it is making your uh, immune system fight and work every day and it's knocking that system down. Something else comes up and it comes up strong because your immune system is already fighting something else. That's why uh, another reason why uh, periodontal disease is such a big deal. So we got a lancet. If you've got a blade, like that one, that big one we said, open that up and, and pop it. The one right here, take your needle and pop it right in the middle of that yellow. Okay? Um, if you can see that up underneath there, and it's close to that, close to the tooth gum line where that interface is, you can slide something right up that edge of the tooth, and, and it'll pop right through and let that drain out. But you got to get it to drain. Do okay? I need to like make sure the drainage doesn't go in the mouth anymore? Uh, I think rinse it out. Those put it out. It doesn't it taste good, but it, yeah, it'll taste bad. Um, it if it's in your stomach, that acid's going to kill it pretty quick. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So I'm not too worried about that. Um, because it's the same type of bacteria that's in your mouth all the time, every day, and every time you put food in it, you swallow that bacteria down. And, oh, so I've got to tell you, this is, these are people that didn't get it done, okay? So if you don't think that an abscess is a big deal, I, I'll bet half of you here know two people here in town that have been in the hospital, one for a week and one for overnight. This is what's called Ludwig's angina. What happened is that infection, and one of them, didn't even show up on an x-ray. But when that infection pushes out on the bottom of your neck here, instead of out to your cheek, you get an abscess, big fat cheek out here, you're pretty much safe, you'll pop that. But if it goes underneath, it can travel. There's three spaces that actually um, come together in your body. Underneath your tongue, back of your throat, and your heart. This is called Ludwig's angina because it can give you heart pain when that infection goes into that third space. And you can see that went all the way into that guy's tongue. And they had to put three drains in and put him on IV drugs for a week to keep him alive. So if you're out in the wilderness and you have a dental abscess, pop it. It's worth the pain. This can, be set, this can go septic. And, and so in a 10-year-old, if this Ludwig's angina happens, they'll be dead in four hours. Okay? So... Um, It'll close, off the, it'll close off their airway and they'll suffocate. So if they don't have medical attention. So uh, a lot of people don't think about this. I've only seen it four times in 11 years. Two of them were people that I know here in, that live here in Millville. So uh, about half of you know them too. Um, and so it, we think it never happens. It does. If a crown pops off, some people will tell you don't put it back on. But if it's cracked up and broken, the doctor's not going to be able to save it. If half the tooth's inside of it, the doctor's not going to be able to save it. But if that crown looks pretty clean, there's just cement in there, clean that cement out. Use some temporary cement and put it back in your mouth. And the reason why I say put it back in is it's going to hold that space. If you leave it out for two to three days, that tooth is going to drift and move far enough that you might need another crown. So if you can put it back in with that temporary um, material, it save you 800 bucks. You can re-cement it back on, it costs 50 bucks instead of 800 do you know? So that's another thing. Also, if you have a tooth that's live and has a crown on it, that pops off. When you breathe in, it's just like that broken tooth. It hurts. You get that temporary stuff, put it back on there, that cap helps it so that it doesn't hurt. Then get in and get it re-cemented. Okay. Stan did this for me. Um, the, the, the little uh, cartoon up here. Okay. So, tra traumatic injury, so Stan put me on it. Okay, traumatic I'm five minutes over, you okay if I do five more minutes? Okay, I hope I'm not boring you to death tonight. Okay, uh, traumatic tooth injury. Your kid falls down and their teeth look like that. Okay? And they're permanent it, ones probably. Yeah, and they're permanent ones, okay? They're pushed back like that. Usually if they're pushed back like that, there's a good chance that the whole tooth was pushed in that bone and the bone was compressed. That bone, consistently that bone's like a dry sponge. You can sit and lowly push on. This one, if you're tough enough, take put your fingers on the back of that and just put slow pressure until they move back into place. Okay? Okay. So, and then you want to get to the dentist. But if you can't, if you leave it like that, they might heal like that and the bone will remodel around it and then you're going to need braces to move on. If you can push those back into place, then you'll save yourself braces or the cost of, okay? 
So, but if we look at it, so if the tooth moved, but it's fractured, okay? So you can see those two cracks on that tooth. Okay, this is a little girl that came to my office two years ago. And when you looked at her teeth, one of them was just down about a millimeter. And that's an indicator that the tooth broke instead of the whole thing moving. Because it was just, just slightly off, not quite. And so what we do with this, years ago we pulled that tooth. There's nothing to do. This tooth is still in her mouth, and that's what it looked like two years after it was broke. If we can stabilize it with, I just took some little braces, stabilized it, the tooth actually grew a ligament, will grow a ligament in between those two broken parts, just like the ligament that holds it in the bone. That tooth is stable, it's fine, it still has a nerve in it, and it's good. So if we know this, we're not going to destroy that tooth and have need an implant, because that's the only other option on that tooth, is an implant. Um, so, that, that, so if it looks like it's just moved a little bit, just looks like it's out of shape a little bit, Get them in as quick as you can. You know, leave it stable. Don't mess with it. But um, and you'll usually know that if you push on it, it really hurts. Okay, or you get that tooth knocked all the way out. Okay, this is your other option. It, the, one of the three things that can happen for trauma. And um, if this happens, don't touch the root part of that tooth. There's going to be a white film on that root part. Pick it up by the crown. Rinse it off with milk. You can take it, stick it in their cheek and haul them to the dentist. Uh, or you can leave it in a, in, a, in a cup of milk. Don't put it in water. The water will kill the cells on, the, on that outer surface of that tooth. And it will ruin the ligament and it will not reattach. If you get to the dentist within a half hour of this, and it's the only problem with them putting it in their mouth, they might swallow it. That's why I say shove it in their cheek. Okay? Because if it dries out, it's not going to work either. If you can get to the dentist within a half hour, you can put it back in there's a very good chance that that tooth will reattach. It'll need a root canal in a couple months because the nerve is dead, but that tooth can be functional for years and years. Okay? Or, if you're not going to be able to get to a dentist, take and make sure you got the right direction and just pressure, put it back in there, and then just stabilize it until you can get in there. Okay? You can put it back in yourself and, and it'll work. Okay? So that's tooth trauma. Okay? Um, last thing really quick. Uh, this is the only slide I have on here. The reason why, um, reason why I put him in here, this go, this is linked to periodontal disease. I worked for a biochemist as a biochemist for three and a half years. He used to always tell me, um, all this dietary stuff is hogwash. He said, take an omega omega three pill and watch your count your calories and you'll be healthy. This doctor is he's a heart surgeon, done over five thousand surgeries, been a heart surgeon for 25 years. Um, he says um, that the reason why, and this year we'll have more people die from a heart attack than we did last year and the year before, and that's with our all of our low-fat diets and, and, and everything that we've been doing with this, with the dietary system that we've had, has actually increased heart attack rate, not decreased it. He says, and this goes back to the periodontal disease where we talk about the toxins getting into your bloodstream and irritating your blood vessels. Okay, he says that when you eat too many omega, it's got to be omega six. Let me look. <coughs> when you eat too many, um, like yeah, omega six, soybean, corn, sunflower, all this, all this processed food and everything that we make from it. Okay, they're good for us, but we need a balance of them with omega sixes. With our dietary system we have now, we are doing omega-6 to 3 ratio of, of 1 to 15 to 1 to 30, when it should be about a 1 to 3. So he says replace those, easiest way to do that is replace your cooking oil with olive oil, because that's the opposite. So that way it balances your omega-3s. When you get too many omega-6s in your bloodstream, and then you eat a nice roll, and you have some processed flours and there's some processed sugars, the sugar attaches to the omega-6 and it turns it into sandpaper, the equivalent of sandpaper in your bloodstream. And that irritates and it gives you a low-grade infection, or not an infection, sorry, a low-grade irritation and inflammation in your artery system. And that's exactly what periodontal disease does. And so this goes along with periodontal disease. And, that, and we know from the studies of periodontal disease that that low-grade irritation and inflammation of, of the bloodstream caused by periodontal disease, and that's what he's saying is here too, 
causes the um, the fatty acids to it makes it so they can adhere to your bloodstream. Okay, and so this guy's study, and he's 25 years, and he says we're wrong. So it's an interesting thing. That's why I put it up there. It caught my attention because for um, three and a half years I did biochemical research, and that's what that professor told me exactly what he does, and that was 20 years ago. And so they're kind of coming around to figuring it out um, that it's the low-grade inflammation, which we knew from periodontal studies, that causes those to um, go in your heart. And, and so it's actually the dietary plan that said low-fat, um, you know, polyunsaturated, all those kind of things. Actually, they're good for us, but in excess, they turn it into sandpaper. That, that our body can't use, it gets kicked back into the bloodstream, it's turned into sand. You know, the equivalent of sandpaper. So, all right, I went about 10 minutes over, sorry. Hope it wasn't too boring for you. And I hope there's something interesting for you. I hope that you learned something. To be continued. Yeah, we'll pick up from here. We'll talk about um, first aid kits, what should be in that. And then talk about, you know, saving a life if somebody's bleeding. And then also, you know, a few other things. If we come up onto an accident... What would we ex what what can we look for to try to save life? The you know shock those kind of things we'll look for airway those kind of things. Yeah. Some of these like these things you know I do really it talks about the different kinds of. Of, you know, disinfectants versus antiseptics. So, and, and that just goes to all my having like a print those. I remember.